Jordan at Oak Ridge, and he will be talking about how to best visualize data and create images using Python and Jupyter. All right, so then we will start off with Colin, and I will stop sharing my screen and hand over the reins. I will try and share my screen, and hopefully it will work. Can you guys all see it? Beautiful. All right, perfect. Uh, I'm going to try and race through this. So I'm going to skip all of my normal introductory stuff. But I should say, this is a shortened version of the talk I gave at APS this year on um, the pre-meeting tutorial. So all of the slides, figures, animations, and codes that were used are available on my GitHub at the link below. And I'll put it at the end as well here. So I only have 15 minutes, so I'm just going to go through a couple different quick things. First, I'll start out by showing some examples. These are figures from a paper that I made uh, uh, last week. So uh, just sort of showing multi-slice, showing my prism algorithm, or showing a more complicated sort of layout of figures here. And these are, these are the types of figures that I generate almost entirely with code. So these are programmatically generated figures. And I'm going to hope that by the end of my talk, or possibly by the end of mine, Erica, and Jordan's talks, you're going to be convinced that, that writing code or writing figures uh, using code is the way to go. Um, other examples, this is a schematic from, from five years ago, a, a uh, um, figure I drew, also programmatically. But I wanted to show this animation that I made for the associated talk here. And you all know that an image is worth a thousand words. I would say a movie is worth a thousand images, quite literally. And so I hope uh, um, to show you sort of how to get started on animating your visualizations uh, um, in this quick 15 minute block here. Um, here's a slightly more complicated animation. I do a lot of scanning diffraction for the stem work. And this is uh, uh, where I was trying to use a movie to explain the difference between recording a single probe position, integrating the intensity, or using a pixelated detector to record a full array of electron counts at each probe position here. And so again, this is a fairly straightforward uh, uh, programmatic visualization. But if you don't know the tricks that go into making something like this, it seems like magic. Uh, and then maybe another quick example here. Below is some experimental data. Above is our reconstructed structures. And so again, these are, these are directly adapted from the paper figures. I just turn them into animated visualizations for, the, for talks. Uh, this is something we have set up in our 3D projector at NSAM, and you can see this 3D movie in our Team 1 silo here. This one I'm cheating a little bit because I did use Blender, but all the input pieces were done in uh, MATLAB. And just to, to sort of demonstrate how you can use the same underlying data but visualize it in different ways, this is plotting the atoms, the grain structure, pulling it apart. I also have a, a volumetric render of these different grains. And so this one wasn't made in uh, Blender. This was done uh, using a volumetric uh, um, rendering engine that I just coded up in that lab. Uh, OK, so what am I talking about for making these visualizations? I'm talking about code into figures. Uh, usually, this can be done um, with high-level programming languages and, and um, visualization packages these days. And uh, uh, it doesn't take a lot of code to write figures like this. And, and so I want to show you a couple quick examples. Uh, I think for programming languages, there's really only two choices for data viz. It's MATLAB or Python. And in the interest of time, I'm not going to go into all of the different advantages and disadvantages here. Uh, suffice it to say, I think they're, they're close to being equal. But while some people might argue that maybe Python is king of data visualization, other people would say that MATLAB is the god emperor of the data visualization universe. And so I do want to say, I've been trying to remake this whole tutorial in Python, but matplotlib is just not quite there yet. It's close, but it's not quite there yet. Uh, but, but I do recommend it going forward. OK, so here's a figure from that same paper. I want to focus on the right-hand panel and sort of show you guys how I built this uh, uh, piece by piece here. So this little sub-panel here showing the atomic positions. So you start with just a scatter plot. It looks like junk if you use the default uh, uh, settings. If you, if you sort of get rid of the gray background, stretch it to your axes, set the aspect ratio to equal in x, y, and z directions. Um, then maybe you want to color the atoms. Uh, or sorry, first I have the camera here. The idea of, of positioning the viewpoint in 3D, all you have to do is specify a camera position where it's pointing, a camera target where the sort of eyeball is looking and the angle uh, of the field of view here. And then if I center my atoms and then color them based on platinum or iron, now we're getting somewhere. So we want to turn something like this that's sort of informative but 
extremely ugly into a beautiful animated visualization. So first, you might want to fill your dots because they look a lot better here, outline in black. And then uh, um, I want to sort of demonstrate splitting it apart here. So this is why you want to build figures like this with code. You could do this in Vesta or any other 3D atom plotting program. But with a programming language, it's very easy for me to just say um, every, every fourth plane of atoms displaced by 70 units. And then you know the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth plane of atoms displaced by 140 units, et cetera. And so if you just write these incredibly short, either, either vectorized or for loop codes, you can do much more advanced visualization. And in particular for this guy, if you look at just all the atom positions, it's not really clear what the underlying structure is. But as soon as you split it apart, you can see the atomic ordering of the platinum and the iron planes inside the particle. OK, so this still looks a little bit ugly. What can we do to, to tune it up a little bit? Well, the first thing is to make a fake specular reflection spot. So I could render fancy 3D spheres, and I could put a light source. I could use Blender. I could do all that stuff. But if you just draw a white dot in front of your red or your blue colored dots and shift it off to the side, it looks pretty good at low magnification, right? So, so this is just an example of how incredibly simple visual tricks can do, you know, can, can fool the eye and make beautiful figures. Uh, what about adding depth cueing? So this looks weirdly flat, but I flip to the next slide and suddenly it pops out to the eye. Right? You see the 3D structure. This is a very simple technique uh, um, called depth cueing. And if you're familiar with painting, for example, watercolor or oil paints, you, you tint or you shade things that are further away from the field of view to push them visually further away. So all I'm doing is I'm darkening the atoms that are furthest from the camera, and I'm leaving the color alone for the atoms that are closest to the camera, and I just have this linear darkening function here, and suddenly it looks a lot more 3D. Um, and, and this is just showing if I change the intercept plane here, I can slice the, the particle up however I want to. I can change the thickness, I can change the splitting, et cetera. So we can, we can see this alternating uh, lattice planes of the iron. And that's how I could show visually, for example, that this is the L12 crystal structure instead of the L10 crystal structure in this case here. Uh, I could also flip it. So instead of splitting the second or Y dimension, I split along the first or X dimension, or in the case of the actual figure for the paper, the third dimension, the Z direction here. Um, and, and then finally, uh, I, want to, I want to talk about a little bit more you can do programmatically. Uh, people who are familiar with GPUs know about NVIDIA's RTX cards for doing ray tracing. But what if I told you you could write seven lines of code and write your own ray tracing engine? It's not complicated. I just do a geometric line from a light source. And if the, if the light source hits an atom without intercepting another atom, I leave the color alone. And if it is intercepted by another atom, I darken the atom. So it's incredibly simple, and yet suddenly we can cast shadows on our, on our particle here. And this wouldn't hold up if you were gonna zoom in and look at a single atom, but if you're looking at a collection of 10,000 or 10 million atoms, it's not bad. Uh, and then finally, if I just tune up the, the, make it so the specular reflection, those white dots I drew, uh, um, I'm gonna make it so that they're facing towards the light source and have a binary flag. I only draw them if they're in the unshadowed area. Uh, and so this is not going to beat a blender render, for example, right? But this is the kind of thing you can do in Matplotlib in, in Python or in MATLAB in, we're talking like 10 to 20 lines of code. It's incredibly straightforward to build these sort of powerful visualizations here. But why, why am I you know, talking about movies here? Uh, what I'm going to do to animate these things is pretty straightforward. I'm going to draw the picture, and then I'm going to save the image, move the camera, and then save it again. So with a very simple for loop, I can just loop over all the different parameters I want to draw and save a series of images, and then use a piece of software like FFmpeg to turn that into a movie, and suddenly we have an animated figure. So uh, in this case, all I'm going to do is I'm going to move the camera in a circle, the target, and I'm going to leave the position alone in the middle of the field of view, and we can animate this guy. And this goes for any of our programmatic fitting variables. We could, we could change them as a function of time and make these simple visualizations. So just to summarize how that works, you modify your script uh, uh, for drawing the function to have these input variables that you want. 
then you you write a control script to call the first function or first script uh, changing these inputs. And then you just save a series of images and then use FFmpeg to stitch it together. Um, and I'm not gonna go into the details of the command lines here, but FFmpeg is um, free, it's easy to use. You can, you can just Google command lines for how to turn a series of images into a movie. Uh, and so this is just showing another example, bringing it all together. Splitting the planes, having our ray trace shadows, having our specular white dots, just incredibly simple and straightforward to do, as long as you A, generate your figures programmatically, and B, set them up so that you can very easily change variables, like how far apart the planes are, or, or what ordering or what angle the camera is set at, for example. Okay, so I only have a couple minutes left here. So I wanna show another example related to diffraction. This is some viz I did to do uh, um, to show the disordering of a, of a sort of a crystalline lattice and how it affects the diffraction pattern of a probe. And so in this animation, I disorder the right-hand side of this uh, um, sample and I leave the left-hand side order. And then I scan a probe back and forth and I show what the diffraction signal looks like as you move from a fully ordered to a fully disordered region. And so this is explaining very simple physical concepts, diffraction from ordered or disordered uh, structures, but doing it with these sort of simple animated figures. Um, so this is just another example on differential phase contrast. I, I was trying to explain how the different semi-angles change the output signal that you get here and how they change the center of mass if you're doing uh, um, probe differential phase contrast measurements in STEM here. But I wanted to point this out because it looks fairly complicated but all three of these different panels are generated with the same function, just changing one input variable, the outer semi-angle of my probe. Um, and so all these scripts are available online if you want to check them out. This, this is a, uh, the same as the first one, except instead of disorder, showing how, how the diffraction signal changes for different oriented crystal grains. And so this one, I'm gonna quickly walk you through the steps here to construct it. Uh, I, I first build a block of atoms, just by tiling some basis function. And so that's just a little bit of linear algebra to tile out an atom. And there's lots of functions that will do this for you, for example, in Python and MATLAB too. You want to rotate a block of atoms, it's just a rotation matrix. So again, very simple linear algebra to do it. Now I want to put these grains together. So I have to delete all the atoms on one side of a plane. Well, you can look up this equation in uh, um, Wolfram Math World, it's the, or Wikipedia, the point plane distance function and then just delete all the atoms that have a point plane distance that's negative or, or leave all the atoms that are positive. And then finally, if you wanted to create a diffraction pattern, I can just write these points into an array, blur them by a Gaussian dot, and then take a Fourier transform of a cropped region, take a Fourier transform of a different cropped region, take a Fourier transform of a different cropped region, et cetera. And that's how I build those probes below the sample. And then drawing the probe, of course, it's pretty ridiculous. It's two lines and a circle. So very, very simple geometry, but if you put it all together, we have, uh, um, oh, and this is showing you can move the probe automatically or move the camera automatically, either of them is quite easy to do. Uh, and then you could put it together to create one of these little animations here. Um, and then of course you can make you know, more dramatic angles. You can modify it for, for different talks or different uh, papers that you're writing, et cetera. So I am going to wrap it up there and just mention the link at the very bottom again. Uh, all, all these functions, all these slides, including the PowerPoint versions and the raw movie files, they're all at my GitHub if anybody is curious. And so I think that's it for my time and I should hand it off to Erica. All right. Well, I hate to follow that because I'm going to take many steps back. Let me share my screen. Um, I'm going to go over some of the very basic rules and tips that I've learned for presenting to different audiences. So this is going to be for presentations versus posters versus papers and how you can present the same type of information different ways for each one of those methods. So there's three types of figures that I'm going to go over. That would be schematics, plots or graphs, something for quantitative data and images and different types of audiences are, as I said, the presentation poster and paper. And you want to think about who you're talking to, no matter what type of presentation you're giving. So a, a, an oral presentation can be for any type of people. So if you're at a conference, obviously, that's going to be your peers, scientific peers.
but you could also give a pre presentation for the general public, and you're going to approach that very differently. So really think about what your audience is for that. Um, but presentations in general are more of a story illustration. So you're using your voice to lead the audience through, and then you're illustrating your story with your slides. Whereas a poster, you're mostly going to be talking to scientific people in a similar field to you, although not necessarily the same field. And for that, you want to think about having a bold clarity. So you want people who are walking by both to notice and understand your poster and, and also to have it catch their eye. And so the paper is, is the most, I would say, complicated of these, detailed perhaps. So this is going to be for scientific people of the same field as you. And you really want to think about making this a scientifically professional document. So that's a very different type of visualization than you would have for a presentation talking to the general public. So thinking about this presentation, I was trying to decide how to best show my points. And um, I decided to analyze the circularity of my cats. So I have two cats named Stormy and Angie, and these are some pictures of them sleeping. Um, I've noticed that Stormy seems to be more circular than Angie when he is sleeping. So I wanted to see if uh, that was quantitatively true. And here are some of the results. This is a very ugly representation of the results, but this is just the very basic. I used ImageJ to trace their outlines of them sleeping and then put those circularity results into Excel. So first let's talk about the schematic. For a presentation, you can use what you have, use the tools that you have. One of those tools is animation. Um, I know that Colin does like PowerPoint. However, I have never coded images, so this is the very best that I can do. Um, if you're using animations to assist, make sure you use them, but don't overuse them. So use them to illustrate the points that you're speaking about, but don't make them too distracting. So right now we have this cat, and I can let you know that I will outline that cat, and then you can make it clear what the parameters are that you're measuring by removing the cat and saying, here are the parameters. And for presentations, make sure that you're using full words for a general audience, and if you want to use the abbreviations for a scientific audience. And make it simple with accent colors. Don't put too many colors or too many different things going on into the presentation. So look at the difference between that and a poster presentation of the same information. So obviously we can't use animations, so it all has to be in the same box on the same um, slide, if you will. And you want to make sure, again, to use those full words, because if someone walks by your poster that doesn't understand what an abbreviation means, it'll make it easier for them to read the entire word. And make sure that it's always understandable without looking at the text or having to search through the text to figure out what is happening. And again, use bold colors, but you can also use boxes and other separate colors to draw the eye. You can see that there's I added some green boxes, so that's just an addition that would be overwhelming in a presentation because it would be too many boxes, too many colors in the same spot. And then for a paper, you obviously want to make it more information and for more knowledgeable audience. So using abbreviations, so C for circularity here instead, A for area, P for perimeter. Um, and always make sure it's understandable without looking at the te text, but you can use the caption to assist, obviously and limit unnecessary colors thinking about that black and white printing. Plots and graphs. For presentations, make sure that there's no excess data being shown in the presentation. Use all the data that you need and show all of the data that you need to make your point, but don't over show data because if there is excess information, it's just going to confuse the audience and they're not gonna understand your point and add interpretation of the data onto the slide so that people don't have to both listen to you and try to interpret the data themselves. So here that would be my saying, Stormy has a narrower range of circularity and a higher circularity, whereas Angie has a wider range of circularity, but she has a more medium circularity. Um, and consider color blindness, that's for almost any of these but the common color blindness is our red, green, and blue, yellow. 
So just keep that in the back of your mind whenever you're making anything that's colorful. For posters, include that detailed data for a scientific audience, but don't make it the main focus. So here I included like a table of the data so that someone could look at it and understand what I'm saying and see the data themselves. But it's not the main focus, the plot is. Um, and make sure the interpretation is mostly in the conclusion section so that you're not overwhelming the person that's looking at the poster trying to understand where your figure is at. And then use imagery wherever relevant. So including that image of Angie might draw somebody's attention a little bit more than purely a plot would. And for a paper, make sure that the plot doesn't have a title and that tick marks are included. There's none in this chart type, but if you have a normal plot, then you would have some minor tick marks. And pair that with a data table where relevant, so you're not including the data as you would with a poster right next to it, but obviously add a separate table into the paper. And again, consider that black and white printing. For strictly images, pair down the images for the presentation. Make sure you're showing either the most important or the most representative image or images. Again, so you're not overwhelming. And remove the background on those. And I'll show very quickly how to do that in PowerPoint because I've met a few people who are not sure how to do that. Um, for a poster, you can add a few more representative images so that it draws attention. But label them so that you don't have to explain. So in the presentation, I could explain this is Angie's most circular image, this is Angie's least circular image. Whereas for the poster, I'm not necessarily going to be right there explaining it as they're looking at it. Um, and pay attention to export resolution, which I'll also mention briefly for PowerPoint on one of the next slides. For a paper, you want to include more images, and that's all of the relevant images, including the quantitative data within the image wherever that is possible. So for this one, including that circularity right next to that image. Okay, brief step for removing the background. There are lots of ways that you can do this, lots of softwares. Uh, for PowerPoint, which is most accessible by most people, there's a quick way to do it in the picture format tab. If you do picture format and then remove background, you can mark all the areas to keep and remove if it doesn't do it automatically. And then keep changes and it's done. Very quick and it makes the image look a lot better if you have something that has a background that you don't want to pay attention to. Image resolution in PowerPoint. So if you don't check this box, then your images will get compressed. If you go to File Options Advanced, there's a checkbox that says Do Not Compress Images in File. Um, so make sure you do that whenever you're creating a presentation or exporting to a poster from PowerPoint. Side note on exporting as an image, if you have to export as an image any of these slides for any reason, if you do the normal export as image, then you're going to get a 96 DPI, which is the default. But you can increase that to 300 DPI with a registry edit. So look that up on the internet and then follow the instructions and back up the registry before you do that so that you don't make any mistakes. But it's really useful because it will make the images a lot more high resolution. And that's it for me and some more wonderful pictures of my kitty cats. And I will pass it off to Jordan. Hey, Eric, since we have a couple questions in the chat, would it be good to just before Jordan starts to address some of those? Sure, yeah, I think they're mostly getting answered in the chat. Um, yeah, so a couple questions, I think, for, I guess, Colin and Erica um, in general. Uh, did you do scrolling, scrolling? All right, to follow Erica's point, Colin does not enjoy PowerPoint, but he said that he does use PowerPoint for the simple animations. Um, and then it was asked, could you please mention how you make paper, paper figures then? I'll pass that to Colin. Oh yeah, I answered it in chat, but I'll just say it again here. And, and clarify too, I don't like making paper figures completely in PowerPoint, but it is a vector format. And so like Erica says, as long as you boost the resolution, you can make decently high quality figures. It's just that Microsoft Office is not super compatible with other things like LaTeX, for example. Uh, 
So that's that's why I don't like it. Um, I use Python or MATLAB, save as PDF, and then I do what's called compositing in either Inkscape, which is free, or Illustrator, which costs money. They're both vector editing programs. Compositing is bringing in the different panels, lining it up how you want, maybe adding labels like A, B, C, et cetera. And uh, um, any vector editing program could do that, including PowerPoint. Yeah. And uh, I don't know about Illustrator. I imagine it's the same way, but it also is great at uh, importing things like EMFs that you want to use for images that you can then composite with the vector. Yeah, graphics. vector formats are all interchangeable, whether they're DXF from drafting software, EMF or EPS from other, other vector sources, or the modern standard PDF. Yeah. Um, cool. And then there was a question, question for Colin again, with powerful uh, GPUs being more available, what are your thoughts on the viability and development of collaborative virtual reality for 3D visualization? I love collaborative VR and AR uh, augmented reality. It's just that mo it's beyond most people's capability to develop. At PNNL, I got to demo a whole virtual microscope that they're building in VR. Totally amazing, but also not super practical, at least for most groups to roll out right now. Whereas anybody can sort of generate movies, slides, figures, put them on for free on the internet or, or do a seminar like what we're doing here. It's very hard to imagine how Erica could have given such a quick, effective talk on presentation modes in VR, because I bet most people on this call don't have VR glasses, for example. So maybe in 10 years, we can revisit this question, but I don't think the time is now. Very nice. All right. Does anybody else have any other questions? You can raise your hand. OK, in that case, we will move on to Jordan. I know I'm sure there will be more. All right. So I was going to do this. Uh, yep. All right. So presumably, I'm sharing my screen now. We can all see my PowerPoint. Looks good. Um, so. Uh, I, I want to say, first off, I really strongly agree with uh, a point Colin made, which is that programmatic figures, I think, should be a gold standard. Um, really, just the level of control you get with programmatic figures can never be matched by anything other than programmatic figures. So you'll always be battling with your figures until you start writing them in code, and then you have direct control over all the parameters. Uh, and so the program I like to use, I don't use MATLAB, I use Python. And specifically, I use a type of Python package called Jupyter. Um, so what is Jupyter? Uh, Jupyter is a uh, data um, science project. Uh, it was started by a couple of guys who just wanted to make data science more accessible to the other people. So the Jupyter name actually comes from Julia, Python, and R, which are the sort of three best ways to tackle data science, um, or in their minds were. Uh, and the Jupyter Notebooks are the sort of crown jewel of the Jupyter package. And so what I wanted to do, instead of talking to you about it, I will actually do a quick demo of a Jupyter Notebook. So, uh, All right, so if I want to run Jupyter, I just open my console and I type Jupyter Lab. And what it will do is it will open a browser window. And this is Jupyter. So what you can see is when it opens, I have a launcher here and I have a sort of browser here. Uh, and this browser just is connected to my hard drive. So I have all my main directories in it. And so I have all my Jupyter notebooks stored in one file. They're sorted out by projects. And so I can go to specific ones I'm interested in, uh, which was here. Uh, I have working notebooks because a lot of times when you're developing these programmatic codes, it takes a lot of different efforts to figure out the right way you want to do it. Uh, but then you can also just go back and you have your main ones that you use to generate your figures. 
And so I just wanted to give you an example of one of these notebooks and how it works. So a Jupyter notebook is a series of cells and you just run them one at a time and it executes your code. Uh, at the start of every Jupyter notebook should be these two specific lines at the bare minimum. Uh, and these are to import NumPy and PyPlot. Um, these are the uh, PyPlot is the plotting software on, or the matplotlib software that uh, Colin talked about. And NumPy is an array handling software that Colin talked about. And basically with just these two libraries, you can do a huge percentage of the functionality in MATLAB right off the bat. And this is all totally free, effortless to download. And so anyone can start using MATLAB up to 90% of the capability of MATLAB really quickly. And so the thing I really like about it is my visual, my vi data visualization and my analysis are in the exact same place. I write the code that analyzes my data and I visualize it in the same exact cell. And by including this one command matplotlib inline, when I execute a line of code, oh, I, yeah, stop. Well, that didn't go right. So you load your, uh, you load your libraries and you execute your code and then here is your data visualization. And now the key thing I think about Jupyter is that it allows you to visualize at three different levels because there's three different times where we need to visualize our data. Sometimes we just need to check our data and it doesn't really matter what the visualization looks like in terms of a professional standpoint. We just need to see it. And so you can see this is super easy. I write myself a little code to load a figure into a specific format. I load it, I do a little bit of Gaussian blurring, and then I'm off to the races. You use a command like subplots and it just creates a two by two grid. You can use imshow to show 2D images and plot to do 1D spectra or 1D line profiles or whatever you want. And so it's very simple to just quickly check your data. And as Colin said, you can set it up so that the different parts of your data are controlled by specific variables. So here I'm looking at some eels line profiles uh, with some different polaritons in a, uh, for some different orders of polariton reflections. And I wanna see what these cross sections look like. So I just have a variable that I can change and then rerun and it'll move to a different area and quickly replot these things out for me. So this gives me a super straightforward way to take basically any type of data and just look over it very quickly to see if what I wanna see is there. But you can't show your PhD advisor this because there's no labels. Uh, they, they, they'd have no idea what they're looking at. So with very little extra work, we're going to skip that. So with very little extra work, we can start adding some additional labeling. So you can see you, you can programmatically set all your X labels and Y labels here. So I just quickly with two lines of commands add uh, all of these values to the edge or all of the uh, uh, Y labels to the materials or to the plots. I have the extent command. So now instead of it just being a raw like showing of the data, now it's calibrated and we know these X axes and Y axes are actually correct. And so now this is something we can show to other people. I could show this as a presentation. I could show this to a colleague. I could show this to my PhD advisor and people would be able to instantly understand it with very little extra code comparing this to the previous uh, uh, cell. But then when we wanna go to uh, publication quality, we have to control a lot more of the aspects. But you can also do this really nicely with uh, these types of programmatic coding. You can set your basic profiles. You can set your font size, the line widths, and journals really care about these kinds of things. So this is actually really important. You can set the size of your figure. You can set the DPI with single commands. And this enables you to really quickly uh, change things if you want. So for instance, all science journals like Helvetica, but then three days later when your paper's rejected, you can just switch this over to Arial for when you submit to Nature. 
and you're already set. Uh, and you can also do uh, what I also like to do is I always create a boundary around the entire figure. And then when I plot it, I can see I said, give me a one column figure. So this is 3.3 inches, and I know exactly what size it will be with respect to the column requirements for different papers. And so I can start adjusting things around, playing with font size, seeing what the actual size of my figures are is compared to the required size requirements for different journals. And then when I am ready to publish that, I just comment those lines out, and I click enter and it's all, and it automatically runs my code. And you can see it saves it. We can save it in whatever file format we want. You can literally just have a, a, an additional argument here that says format equals TIFF, format equals PNG, format equals PDF. And it comes out instantly. Uh, and so for me, this is the only way I can even visualize doing my data visualization. That pun wasn't intended, it just came out naturally. Um, uh, and so just to finish up, I wanted to co cover a few key points about Jupiter that I really like. Uh, one, it really is super powerful. And a lot of the things I like about Jupiter, I really just like about Python. And the Jupyter aspect is just a way to run Python code. Between these NumPy and SciPy libraries, we're coming close to the functionality of MATLAB. And the matplotlib is directly reverse engineered from MATLAB's plotting software. And it does really, really well right up until you start doing 3D stuff. And then it falls short of MATLAB. Uh, and then for me, the other key thing is it saves your analysis. So let me go back to my demonstration. Here's a, an analysis I do for one of the, uh, uh, for, for the actual figure from the paper. And you see, I actually have quite a diff bunch of cells doing quite a bu diff bunch of different things. And I run through a whole lot and then all the way at the very end, I get my final figure. But once this is done, I don't even need to rerun this code. Every single step is saved automatically. So if I'm trying to remember what I did, I can just go through, see all the validation steps one at a time, clearly visualized. And more importantly, if I want to then transfer it over to a different data set, I can literally just copy and paste my notebook, load a different file in at the start of my notebook and run it through all the way and get the exact same figure with a totally different data set with no extra work. Uh, and then the key thing for me is it's uh, not just saved and transferable, it's distributable. I can post this Jupyter Notebook online and then anyone can have access to my analysis. Or if Colin thinks I'm doing my 40 STEM analysis wrong, I can send him my Jupyter Notebook and show him that yes, I am doing it wrong and I need to fix something. Uh, and th these are the key things that really improve the quality of scientific communication. And the last point is, while I agree that Matplot or MATLAB is the god emperor of data visualization, Jupyter and Python has one thing that, in my opinion, makes it superior to MATLAB at a fundamental level. It's free. Uh, and quite frankly, like the power doesn't, of MATLAB doesn't overcome the freeness of Python. Uh, it, and it, it has a bunch of different benefits. One, you can just download it and play around with it, even if you're not sure that's what you want to do. So there's really a low barrier for entry, and anyone can get started right off the bat. And two, it is becoming very, very widespread in the, science, in the scientific community, especially amongst people in the material science and physics communities that we as microscopists are gonna be primarily working with. So when you program in Python, you have a higher chance of being able to share your code with colleagues, collaborators, and peers than you do with any other type of coding. Uh, and quite frankly, my favorite part about it is because it's so widespread, I don't actually need to know how to code it. 
If I have a question, I just go on Google type, how do I do this? And then a Stack Overflow question with 300 uh, upvotes comes up where a guy's literally written the code for me and I can just copy and paste it directly into my notebook and start going immediately. And so all of these things really make Python accessible. And then especially the way Jupyter works enables uh, the Jupyter notebooks allow you to communicate these analyses and visualizations really effectively amongst your uh, peers. And also it serves as a sort of personal lab notebook, which is critical for me. And like it saves what I do. So if I need to come back to something I did three years ago, I don't have to try and remember what I did. It's still there exactly where I left it. And I can just start running that code again. So why Jupyter? Uh, I think it's incredibly effective for all sorts of different types of visualization, whether you're just checking data, whether you're trying to show your data to someone else around the lab, or whether you're trying to prepare a figure for presentation at a conference or in a paper. It's easy to use. It's really not that hard to get started. Like I, the tutorials that are available, the documentation on Stack Overflow is incredible. So you can literally just start doing this today and start getting nice looking results almost instantaneously without any programming background. So uh, uh, for me, that is really the powerhouse of it. Because then if you, a colleague of yours is asking what to do it, you could just force them to download uh, Jupiter and start running your notebook rather than trying to convince, tell them in some other way what you did. Uh, and this really improves scientific communication. It helps when we bring new postdocs into the lab. I don't really have to spend that much time with them showing them how I did my analysis. I just give them my notebooks. They know Python, they know notebooks, they take my notebook and they're off. And then their notebook, they give back to me later. It really increases the way we're able to transfer these analyses and visualizations amongst each other. And so with that, I'm finished. Um, and I will take any questions. Incredible, as always. Thank you very much. Yeah, Jupiter is extremely powerful, and I think you just showed why. Easy to use. Do we have any questions from the audience about Jupiter or any of the... Uh, kind of figure capabilities of Jupyter or Python in general? Jordan, have you played around with uh, any of the 3D rendering softwares like Myavi or Paraview or any of those? They seem, uh, they're pretty I nice. Have, I have played around with Blender and Blender interfaces with Python nicely. Uh, it does. But there is a much steeper learning curve on Blender than there is on Matplotlib. So I would say I have not yet incorporated any of the things I've done in Blender into any publication quality data. I, I use Illustrator when I need sort of 3D things because the extrude and bevel functions on Illustrator are reasonably effective and at my intellectual level. Um, I see Colin grimacing at this thought, but it, it's if it so works, if it works, it works. I, I, I want to add something to what you said about Blender though. Blender, it's hard to learn, but if you mouse over any button in Blender, it pops up the Python function you need. And so I would actually say Blender is easier to learn by writing Python than it is to learn by using it. Uh, and so I, I think in 10 years, if I give the same presentation, it, there will be no MATLAB, it will be Blender and Python. Does Blender have a, a graphic user interface for yep. Python? Or it's the Blender is just the, the regular it, front end of Blender? Oh, sorry. Blender is a GUI program, yeah. but every single function in Blender can be called through the Python interface API. Yeah. Okay. Wonderful. All right. One more question came in from Rebecca here at UVA. Thanks for coming. Uh, a little new data visualization via coding, similar to Erica, but have recently started using R. It's a little tangential question, but do you think it is worth pursuing R for data visualization, or do you think switching to Jupyter and MATLAB 
early would be best. Switch. Switch. Switch now. Uh, <laughs> Jupiter let, is let so me, easy to use. <laughs> do the flow chart for R. Do you do statistics and nothing else? Yes, or a reasonable choice? No, <laughs> it is not a reasonable choice. And nobody, nobody in the field really uses R to any serious extent. Like uh, I'm, I'm familiar with R from my undergrad days and I've seen the sort of things it can do when it's used right. And it's a really powerful tool, but for what we do, which is so based off of images and spectra, MATLAB and NumPy is the way to handle these things. Like your analysis will be better and your visualization of the analysis will be way better with those two options. Not to mention someday to soon, you have to learn machine learning or other advanced things, let's say. And then you're gonna, you're gonna be way better off if you already know how to use Python, way better off. Yes. All right. R, R is rough. R is coded by people who don't want to make it easy, whereas yes. Python is coded by people who do want to make it easy. All right. So I had two sets. We had uh, pre submitted questions, um, and then we also allowed for posters or figures to be submitted. There weren't any figures, uh, but there were three questions, two categories. Working on sharing my screen while I'm babbling. All right, here we go. Can you see it? Yep. All right. I don't know if I was still looking at my screen or. All right, there we go. All right, and I know some people are passionate about these. Uh, so we had one about physics visualization, two about color maps. Uh, start with color maps. Was a uh, where do you stand on showing atomic resolution images or some other images in grayscale or false color? Uh, and then also a question about, uh, or more just a statement, talk about color maps and then uh, concepts of things like dynamic range, luminescence, sequential, continuous, and divergent maps. So we didn't get any submitted picture images, so I just threw one together of uh, four different color maps. And I'm gonna let you all have at it. So uh, Eric and I are, are working together on a paper. We literally just had an argument about this uh, a <laughs> few days ago. Um, I'm a big fan of high contrast color maps, the non-sequential, non-mathematically generated color maps that have a lot of different color regions. Uh, I really think these allow you to strongly visualize when you have weak effects in the same data set uh, data set as strong effects. Um, and the most important goal of any type of figure is to convey what a deep dive into that figure or into that data set would get for anyone who was investigating that data set themselves. This is my personal philosophy. So I really don't think that it is necessary to use sequential color maps. Now, granted here, I like the Inferno way better than the uh, high contrast rainbow color map he used for these atomic resolution images. But I also think this is slightly different for something like Hadif, where the direct interpretability of the image is the key benefit of using the technique in the first place. So I would always use grayscale, inferno, hot, or something like that for any sort of HADIF image. But for my uh, spectroscopy data, if I have 2D energy filtered windows for my EELS analysis, I will play around with color maps and use the one that I think best emphasizes the phenomena present in the data set, not based off of any sort of quantitative accuracy of that color map. Just so everyone's on the same page, can you define what sequential, continuous, and divergent color maps are? Here, I'll show it. Uh, yeah, linear luminosity is what he means. Sequential meaning the page already up, I think. Yeah, if you convert to grayscale, does it maintain that proper white to black grayscale? Basically, is is whether it's a single direction color map. And divergent is starts at white and then goes to black if you go darker or brighter, or starts at uh, uh, light and goes to black if you go brighter and darker. And um, so for that, yeah, 
for that rainbow color map, there'd be sections where it would get bright and then dark and then bright and then dark in the same color map as the intensity increased. So. Well, while Eric's pulling it up though, I do wanna, I wanna take a page out of Erica's presentation here. It depends on what you're trying to show. So if you're trying to show that this dot is twice as bright as that dot, you absolutely should be using grayscale, something that's as close to linear in luminosity as possible. But in that image that Eric had, which hopefully he can pull back up in a second, the upper left corner was slightly thicker than the upper right corner. Uh, if, if you look at the, the lower left one here, you can see the orange in the background. The other three color maps, uh, uh, top, top half of the micrograph. Um, no, no, up, yeah, that micrograph, left-hand side. See how the background goes orange? And then on the right-hand side, it goes to yellow. These subtle effects are invisible in the other color maps. Or maybe a more germane example, how wide is this interface? Is this atomically sharp or is there blending? I would say that the lower right-hand color map, this blue-red one is the best one at seeing, but it really is about two atomic columns or maybe three atomic columns thick, right? So, so take the advice from Erica's talk, tune it to the parameter that you're trying to show. Very nice. Yeah, I think that's a good point. Yeah. All right, let's see if I can pull, let me exit. There we go. Uh, and to explain sequential and stuff. So again, on uh, the Mapplotlib page, they have all these examples of their color maps. So sequential, it's continuous, right? You can kind of see that they're divergent. You have multiple colors and it goes apart. But this is probably best visualized if you look at something like their lightness, for example, and their uniformity. So they have these because it's it's if you look at the lightness, it's almost linear, increasing. Um, but then if you go to a map like a divergent one, you can see that uh, there's a kink in it, right? So then it shows the divergence within the data, which is perceptually uniform on either side of that kink then, and you see the divergence because our eyes are good at that luminescence. Um, and then there are like the rainbow color maps, which are hard to pick out, but there are also uh, rainbow color maps, which are very good for then spectroscopy, as Jordan was saying. Uh, turbo, and you just have to turbo. play with them. Use, use turbo, turbo for spectroscopy. Yeah. It's very uniform. Uh, you still have that high range of, uh, kind of color cycling as Jordan's talking about, um, or even this cube helix one, right? Uh, yeah, that would yeah, be a really good you one. Go up one. Uh, I read, a, I was reading a lot of papers about on ARPAs and they love these just earth terrain color maps. And it's because there's a few places you have a lot of contrast change, both at the top of the color map and at the bottom of the color map. So you can nicely emphasize your strongest features while still demonstrating that the weaker features are detectable. And so I think that fits in with what Colin and Erica were saying. It's like, you have to tune to what you actually want somebody to see in the image. And, and maybe one last point on this, doing the figures programmatically means you can take a linear color map, but you can non-linearly scale your data in a way it emphasizes upper and lower contrast or mid contrast or whatever you're trying to show. Just if you do something like that, always put the raw data in supplementary materials. Otherwise referees like me will reject your paper. All right. And then there was another question. Is there a good tool for creating three-dimensional models, complex arrangements of atoms? Um, for showing things like phase transitions and materials? I think Colin definitely showed that MATLAB is 100% capable of it. And we talked about in Python, um, there's also uh, ASE is good at like loading sets of atoms if you have predefined phases. And then you can use things like Myavi or Paraview uh, to, to render the three dimensional data, or it sounds like Blender as well. Uh, you guys have yeah, one, maybe one quick comment. This? The ASC environment in Python, I thought it was really good uh, up until I started working with like a million or a billion atoms. And then I started to go insane. Uh, it, it, it's all about scale, right? Uh, I, think, I think for Python, starting out with ASC or Matt, um, uh, Matt Plot, or sorry, what are they called? The Materials Project backend, uh, PyMatGen, 
uh, those are good for small phases, but for the actual visualization plotting it, I don't have a huge amount of experience with maybe uh, Paraview I have used, it's pretty good. Um, uh, I've used uh, Amira and a few other packages, but in the end, I always came back to MATLAB because you need the fine grained control for the things I'm trying to plot at least. Uh, Eric, maybe you can speak about maybe a pair of you if you have some experience with both or Jordan or Erica. I don't have experience with pair of you. Uh, I think it, you, it has a Python interface and then it, I think it renders, it just feeds into the, the parameters into a C++ or something. But I have not used it myself. I've just uh, seen a lot of references I, I to it. My Opti is super easy. Was that Best of story you were saying, Jordan? Yeah, I use Vesta, import the vector image into Illustrator and manipulate it there. Uh, yep, I, I love Vesta. I, Vesta's like a powerhouse program. I, like you couldn't do the things Colin was doing, but you can do a lot with Vesta. Yeah, you can do you can do bonds. You can do those fancy graphs when you have a perovskite and you want to show the octahedral site and you want to make it transparent. Vesta can do all of that with multiple phases and it reads all the crystallographic data sets. And, and you can just, if you need to, pick up an atom and move it somewhere else, right? If you, if you need to customize it, right? So uh, another big thumbs up for Vesta from me. And I, I, I slice I even, the crystal in half too, uh, to show structure. Yeah, I would even have loops with Jupyter Notebook where I'd create SIF files, send it out, open Vesta, create... <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jordan, you're killing me. Uh, yeah, you can do that kind of rendering also in Myavi, though. Um, and you can do the slicing. You can do the animation type of stuff that uh, Colin was talking about. Only problem is, again, the, uh, the, when you have a lot of atoms, you end up just crashing Myavi, and it becomes a memory issue. Um, and definitely, yeah, Vestas has a nice user interface also. It's very simple. I feel like I should say we're not sponsored by any of these software companies. <laughs> <laughs> right, let's see. Are there any more questions in the chat? I do not see any. All right. Well, I would like to uh, thank everybody again for attending. And uh, again, sign up for the uh, PMC if you haven't. Check out our student council page. Uh, Jordan, Colin, and Erica are very friendly people. You can find them very readily online and their emails are everywhere. Uh, I can speak from personal experience. They are, if you email them, they will email you back and they will give you very, very helpful information. Um, so do it and don't hesitate to. Um, yeah, thanks for attending the webinar and I will see everybody around. Bye, everyone. Thank you, everyone.